out with, with uh, UPS. And, and really, the, some, of, some of you may not be familiar with how big, uh, how important energy is um, for you as, a, as an input. So first of all, give us an idea of, of how, this, how, 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 how large this looms in your world. Okay, certainly well. Well, first, Daniel, let me just and tell everyone here, we're glad to be here. And it's been an interesting morning so far. But you know, at lunch today, I was sure hopeful that they would change this blue background to a UPS brown background. <laughs> Didn't quite make it, but uh, that's okay. But you know, this is a very important topic for us because our energy bill is about $4 billion a year. So other than labor, that would be our biggest cost element. So for us, energy and fuel conservation is not either sustainability or it's good business practices. It has to be together because it's such an important part of our cost. So clearly then it's a, it's a very major part of your planning as you, as you look, at, look to the year ahead. So 2014, what do you see uh, as the main factors for you and how do you plan for them? Well, you know, one of the things we look at is, is what the financial markets are saying. And, and what they're saying right now, if you look at the futures, is that they expect energy costs to, to be about the same as it uh, is in 2013, maybe slightly less. So they seem to feel pretty comfortable balancing supply versus demand. Now, there's a lot of variables that can take place, right? So whether it's uh, acts of God or acts of, uh, of uh, man or whether it's the uh, geopolitical tensions, it's emerging markets having a surge or the U.S. and North America production if it continues to increase. So there's a lot of things there that can vary. And so we analyze it all. We look at it. One of the ways that we hedge for those fluctuations is through our fuel surcharge. But the main two areas that we focus on is conservation. We say that uh, our greenest mile is the one that we never run. And we utilize technology, especially our Orion optimized dispatch, where with that and other technologies, in the last 10 to 12 years, we've eliminated or avoided 364 million miles. So that's one of the ways that we deal with fluctuations in energy is we try to use as little of it as we can. And then second is through alternative fuels. And we have a rolling laboratory and we have one of the largest fleets of uh, alternative fuels so that we're not just fossil fuel oriented or dependent. So people talk a lot these days about big data. Um, presumably data gathering is part of the input to uh, to, to, to optimize the journeys that you do. Is that, uh, is, that, is that moving on very fast for you? You know, it really is. And when I first started with UPS, we had to wait until the packages were actually loaded onto the trucks for the drivers before we knew how to dispatch. Today, we have the information that comes through big data well before the packages even arrive into the city. And we're able to plan stop by stop based on that particular information. And you can be so much more effective, so much more efficient. And we're rolling out this latest technology. We have over 500 people dedicated to just rolling out Orion in 2014 because we know how many miles that it will save and will lower our fuel cost and it will lower our carbon footprint, which is very important to us. Uh, now, I think Minister Alison Maduke is here. So if, um, if uh she would like to join us, then um, we, our panel will be complete. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, one final question I wanted to put to you. I'm sure that uh, um, many of you will have seen this uh, uh, Amazon uh, news item early this week of, of, of drone delivery. Um, for the, so I, I'm curious to know what, what your take on that is and whether we're going to see this in the next few years or whether it's just sort of science fiction. Right. You know, I would really be surprised if you had not asked me this it, it question. Could, you know, we could have a drone coming in the That's window right. any time now. <laughs> but uh, I was in the airport yesterday leaving Atlanta. I had my UPS briefcase and someone stopped me in the middle of the airport and said, 
I saw your special on 60 Minutes. You're the guys that's doing the drones. <laughs> and it uh, wasn't quite us. But you know, the dr drones in the future certainly have a lot of potential. Now, I'm not sure that, uh, that we see that in the immediate future, being able to deliver packages to everyone's uh, uh, homes uh, anytime soon. But I mean, there is potential. Now, will it work better in areas that aren't quite as congested versus trying to land a, a drone right down in the streets here? You know, you've got to make sure you're not landing on top of people, right? The FAA has got to certify this. You've got to be able to avoid commercial flight zones. But that I, does not at all should indicate that we're not uh, high on the possibility. You know, we spend more on technology than any of the other uh, uh, transportation companies. And we are looking at these possibilities as well as we are many others in technology. So I think it's got its potential, it's got its challenges. Timing may have a lot to do with just how quick this happens, just through regulations and those kinds of things. Good, well let's move on to, to Jim and to, to uh, f agriculture and food, which is, is your uh, focus. You know, we're looking at a world in the future with, with another two billion plus people uh, between now and 2050. So the, mm -hmm. the challenge of uh, feeding all those mouths is, is presumably something you're, you're focused on. And uh, obviously in 2014, it's only small steps towards that, but, but it is that, that is the, the way that you have to be thinking. So uh, do you see that as a manageable challenge? It, we do think it's possible to rise to that challenge. One of the things we can't do is wait till 2049 to work on it. Uh, the problem, <laughs> uh, the challenge is, is here today. We know there's uh, over 800 million people that are chronically malnourished today. Um, and, and so the challenge is here. Probably the most important thing, though, is the consumption or the demand for food is rising at a rate slightly higher than production. Production continues to go up. And, and uh, so that means there's a gap. And, uh, and so the challenge is we have to start today. And we have to find ways to improve productivity for farmers around the world. Um, and uh, we've seen over the last few years some price spikes, uh, largely because there's not much of a shock absorber in the system. There's not a lot of inventory. And, and if you have uh, a grain shortage in one area, it, it immediately pops up as a, as a, as a price spike. So, uh, but for 2014, we're hopeful that with uh, good harvests that are projected, we should have uh, uh, an easing of food prices uh, for the near term, unless we have a, an issue next year. And we're going to keep at our uh, work of trying to advance science and working with farmers to help them uh, improve productivity. Presumably, many things come into the mix here. I mean, there's, there's, it's partly. Uh, efficiency, well, actually the logistics question of not wasting food that is already grown. Mm. Uh, there's changing in, 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 in eating habits, there's, there's um, getting rid of food protectionism, but then there's mm. the technology of food production itself. So what, yeah. and that presumably is, is something that you have, that you're particularly yeah, uh, we're, engaged in, and, and what can we expect from that? Yeah. We're actually engaged in all of those, um, and so you're right. First of all, one of the things is more food. How do we improve productivity on the farm around the world. Um, many people don't realize that 85% of food in the world never crosses an international border. But if we're going to add 2 billion people to sub-Saharan Africa and India and Southeast Asia, it's going to have to. We're going to have to improve production there, and we're going to have to increase the ability to, to get food where it needs to be. Um, and, uh, and we have to do that without a lot of additional resources. You know, land is limited. Um, nutrients are limited. Um, agriculture already uses about 70% of the fresh water. So we've got to find ways to essentially double production with the same amount of inputs that we have today. And that's going to take science. Um, and it's also going to take working closely with farmers. Uh, you mentioned big data a little while ago. Uh, you know, we can get great products to farmers, but they have to have the information to be able to use them. And, uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was out in, in Iowa with some farmers as they were harvesting. And as the, as the crop is coming in now, they have uh, monitors that are tracking the yield and the moisture uh, on a 10 square meter grid. So they have maps. We, we provide services to the farmers that help them overlay soil and yield and, and uh, uh, hybrids, et cetera, so that they can get all of that data integrated in a way to make better decisions and make the most efficient use of the resources that they have. I suppose that's the high end of it, but at the, you know, even in poorer countries these days, the, 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 the mobile phone is, is mm. an extraordinarily uh, change-bringing technology to, to rural areas. Exactly. We, uh, 
Uh, I was just in Ethiopia in, in May and opened a, uh, a new seed production facility there. We do business in a number of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, local production and research. And you're right, cell phone uh, uh, technology to, to get information out. Um, uh, we're working with uh, mobile soil uh, testing um, so the farmers can get more ready access to just what basic nutrients they need in the soil. Oftentimes it's difficult to do that. So whether you're in a really advanced area or some of the even subsistence areas, it's good products and information that makes the difference. And then just final question, focusing on 2014 specifically, what technologies are just around the corner that, that, that are going to make a difference? There's a long list of really exciting things going on. Probably the one that excites me the most is um, um, a soybean oil that we call Plenish that's uh, uh, just about to be get its final registration in the EU for imports and it'll be raised so in the US. So soybeans uh, right now produce a large amount of vegetable oil that's used by all of us in all sorts of, not only salad oils, but in baking and cooking uh, uh, and fast food restaurants. But soybean oil is, um, in many cases, has to be hydrogenated, and that raises other issues with trans fats. Um, we found a way to, to have the soybean maintain the high level of oleic acid, which is a stable uh, and healthier profile of fatty acids that, uh, that, that you want to have. Uh, all the way through its maturity. And so you can get a commodity crop with a healthier oil. It'll have consumer benefits uh, in a lot of different ways. And so we're excited about that. Oftentimes people talk about biotechnology. This is one of the biotechnology products that's gonna have uh, consumer impact, which uh, is very positive. Good, thank you. Well, let's move on to, to, to the minister and to Nigeria. How do you see 2014 for for your sector in particular and, and, and for Nigeria, which uh, we've been hearing at various times today is, is, is obviously one of, the, one of the biggest emerging markets now and, and a, a rising star. Well, I think um, generally uh, we expect uh, 2014 to see an explosion or the beginning of an explosion in the gas sector in Nigeria. Uh, we're pulling forward the gas master plan from the petroleum industry bill, which is now in front of our parliament, which is an amalgamation of over 16 previous uh, laws in the oil and gas sector. Nigeria has 187 trillion cubic feet of gas, uh, which is in already reserve in the reserve. We have 600 uh, in undiscovered potential. So we expect to move Nigeria into um, a gas exploration and production zone as opposed to crude, which has been our traditional area. But quite apart from that, uh, we are looking as well to ensure that we commercialize gas. And I think this is um, an area that all uh, oil producing countries are uh, looking at going forward, ensuring, of course, that you create real jobs and real employment for your people. Oil and gas is a highly cap capital um, intensive uh, sector. Uh, so we do need to pull it down and ensure that it impacts uh, the polity in the first place. Uh, so we are moving gas into gas for feedstock as opposed to its traditional use as gas for fuel. We're bringing in petrochemical plants, fertilizer plants, very critical as we've just heard in terms of food production, methanol plants. We're looking at LPG to move away the polity from their overdependence on kerosene and of course on firewood, which is another area that impacts the entire uh, um, sub-Saharan uh, Africa as well uh, to ensure that um, we, we get more environmentally friendly fuels uh, for general use in our homes. And these are, these are critical things. They're not thought of all the time, but they're very fundamental, particularly for emerging um, economies. And apart from that, we're looking at our downstream, uh, trying to ensure that we privatize our refineries, uh, get them into efficient, effective, you know, private competitive uh, uh, hands and to hope that um, over the next five years, we will actually become a net exporter of refined petroleum products instead of a net importer, which is quite interesting since Nigeria is one of the, uh, I think it's about the eighth largest producer of oil um, and gas in the world at this time. So these are the core um, areas that we're looking at. Um, globally, as you know, Africa is already uh, being looked at as a major emerging uh, market. And therefore, we are trying to ensure the balance uh, of, of our investments uh, to attract sustainable investment continuously 
into Nigeria um, and, and manage it over a period of time. The petroleum industry bill is extremely important because it brings transparency and accountability to an area that has for some time been seen as rather opaque in Nigeria, and in fact, I think in other parts of Africa as well. So those are the areas we'll be looking very, very um, critically at you know, as we go forward in 2014 and beyond. And, and presumably this transparency is a key part of trying to ensure that, that the energy sector is, is a blessing rather than a curse for a, a country like Nigeria. I mean, it isn't easy to manage a, a large industry like this uh, without having unfortunate knock-on effects, whether it, whether it be on the effect of the, uh, the, the, the currency that can then cause troubles for other sectors or for environmental uh, damage uh, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. How else do you, do you plan to manage those sorts of issues in the coming year uh, to ensure that Nigeria is on the, really the right track for that? Well, as I said earlier, we would ensure that um, the reforms that are already inherent in the petroleum industry bill, which actually take care of pretty much everything you have spoken about, um, are properly implemented over the next two, three, four uh, years. We have a real issue with um, the opaqueness of the sector and ensuring that it becomes competitive along private lines or private sector lines, yeah. which has been a major problem over the last uh, 10, 15 years. At this point, we have an even greater issue as well, the issue of crude oil theft, um, which has become very unique to Nigeria. Nigeria is losing, um, at times, up to 200,000 barrels of oil per day at this time, more than some countries actually produce. And um, we haven't found this situation uh, at such a scale anywhere else in the world. This is particularly uh, of particular concern because we believe it tra translates into economic terrorism economic sabotage for the country. We are clear at this point in time that most of this oil is not being refined in the Gulf of Guinea. It's being refined outside um, the Gulf of Guinea shores. We are also very clear that most of the fiscal output and returns from this scourge are also being laundered, not through African banks for the most part, but through banks further afield. So it has become um, in, in, in a sense, what we consider economic terrorism in, in, in many, many areas. This is our mono product in Nigeria. So Nigeria's economy depends on oil, depends on it being efficient, it depends on the efficacy of how we not only manage the resources, but how we keep them sustainable you know, in the short and medium term. And then, of course, how we deploy, deploy those resources uh, for the entire nation. And these are all the areas that we will be aggressively focusing on 2014 isn't, and beyond. Isn't part of the difficulty precisely that, that when, when oil is a, a mono product, that yes. many people uh, who, who perhaps, mm -hmm. um, particularly in, in environmentally damaged areas, don't have uh, the possibility mm -hmm. of their traditional livelihoods turn to theft because that's really all there is. So mm -hmm. it, it becomes more than just an issue of criminality. It's a question of broader uh, development alternative opportunity for, for, for people on the land. How, how, how do you address that? How do you begin to address that? I think that? the government over the last uh, three years in particular, uh, with Mr. President's transformation program, has been focusing very, very robustly on diversifying the economy. We cannot continue with a mono product. You know, it's, well, it's not sustainable in the first place. It's not a finite resource. Mm -hmm. And with the incidents, a high incidence now, of uh, US shale oil and gas coming onto the global scene, Nigeria, as all other countries, um, particularly the OPEC you know, countries, um, have had to sit back and take a, a really serious look at exactly how we're going to manage to sustain our economies, uh, given the fact that, for instance, the US was the fifth um, largest uh, export destination for Nigeria's oil, uh, which is very high, and it's dropping rapidly. So we're now having to look towards India and China and some of the more emerging markets you know, for that. But the government has been focusing very, very aggressively on diversifying the economy, particularly in areas such as agriculture, which is why I was very interested in what Jim was saying here. 
For the first time, I think, in the last uh, 10 years or so, the Nigerian government is actually really putting a lot of effort into reviving what used to be a very thriving uh, sector of the economy. Now you realize that obviously if agriculture uh, comes up uh, to something near its uh, former levels in terms of uh, productivity, uh, then we create jobs for a very high percentage of the economy, not, not to mention being self-sustainable in terms of uh, uh, food production. So those are the areas we're going to concentrate on. Manufacturing, which had also gone down because of the high incidence of uh, oil. But, and agriculture, even in the Niger Delta, because of the fish farming uh, that has also gone as, you know, awry uh, because of oil production. But in the long run, in the, in the medium to long run, I think that the policies that are being put, into, put down today and that are being um, um, cemented uh, will actually create a very, very necessary diversification of the, uh, the economy. And indeed, the mobile phones you just spoke about, for the first time, we've actually uh, um, utilized mobile phones for farmers to use in getting or accessing fertilizers, mm -hmm. never done before in Nigeria. The corruption that we saw in the sector in fertilizer, bringing in fertilizers into the country, um, has been pretty much eradicated over the last two and a half years. So we're moving very aggressively on, on that note, and I do hope that we will, with the implementation of the Petroleum Industry Bill, be able to move just as rapidly in transforming the oil and gas sector in the country as well. Okay, now we've covered a lot of ground, but let's uh, uh, open questions to um, any of our panelists who'd like to ask a question. Any questions? I can't see. Yeah. No, sorry, but there's some. Oh, thank you. Um, Ken Cooley, I'll try one. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the disappearance of bees or the crash of the uh, bees for pollinization of crops. And it seems to be a multi, uh, a problem with many sources, but among them are some of the uh, chemicals being produced for, for improving crops. Uh, has anybody been able to address that? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It, the pollinator issue is obviously a really important one. We're not involved in the, in the, class, the class of chemicals that currently is, is uh, under scrutiny, so I'm not the best expert around that. But, uh, and I know there are, as you said, it looks as though there are a number of possible causes. But in any case, uh, it, it is an important issue because for agriculture, we need the pollinator uh, uh, colonies to be healthy. And uh, fr from our point of view, uh, off-target issues like uh, beneficial insects and et cetera is a really important part of the testing that we do up front. So uh, good product stewardship remains important to us. We, uh, we're not involved at this point in the, with chemistry that's involved in that particular issue, so I'm not close enough to it to say exactly what the solution is, but uh, we do agree it's an important issue. I think the, uh, the companies that are involved are working hard to better understand it, and hopefully we'll be able to Number one, find the root cause, and then number two, take whatever actions necessary to, to avoid any issues. Other questions? Yes, at the lady, at the, and, then, and then after that. Hi, this is Catherine Morris with PwC. Uh, this is a question for David. Uh, you had, uh, Daniel had asked about the Amazon drones, so I can't ask about that, but um, <laughs> re uh, <laughs> related to that, are you thinking about the impact that 3D printing will have on your business, and if so, what uh, what thoughts do you have there? Okay, I heard. Are you thinking about the impact of something on my business? But I didn't hear three D printing. So 3D I guess printing. The, the idea no one would be manufacturing anything in different places anymore. It would right. all be you wouldn't have to uh, deliver anything. You know, uh, <laughs> well, we don't think that's going to be the case. <laughs> but uh, we have thought a lot about that. In fact, uh, uh, on a small basis, but an important basis, we offer 3D printing capability at UPS stores today. And um, we offered that, oh, I guess, six months or so ago. And, uh, and we talked to a lot of our customers. And you know, we're, our customers are gonna be the large uh, multinationals, but it's also gonna be the small and mid-sized uh, customers. And this is on a lot of their minds. And, and what it's going to allow, I think, is, 
is instead of this mass production, it's going to allow a lot more customization. It uh, may mean that people can manufacture much closer to their end customer. And we think that it, just like a lot of other changes, will affect the supply chains around the world, will affect us, but that we have to be able to adjust to that. So if 3D causes, instead of these huge factories that are producing thousands or millions of units, it may be a lot more locations that are much smaller, and then we would adjust our network accordingly. At the front here, yeah. If you keep your hand up, then you can, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I was wondering uh, how much, if at all, the U.S. shale gas boom would affect the Nigerian gas industry? Very much so. I think, um, as I said, it's already affecting us um, quite uh, uh, a lot in terms of crude, our crude um, exports. Uh, to put you in the picture, I think in, in 2007, um, our exports of gas uh, to the United States were in the region of 12%. Um, over the last 12 months, that has dropped to about 1%. So that gives you an indication of how, how much it affects us. And that is synonymous. It's, it's the same uh, effect you will see all across um, Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. Africa has become very competitive now uh, because um, there are a lot of new kids on the block in terms of oil and gas discoveries at this point in time. But it's affecting us all across the plain. Uh, but it also, there are pros and cons to everything. It also means that Africa has to sit back. We are taking another look at the situation. We have to, Im we have to um, get a good balance of our investments in terms of our exports uh, of oil and gas. And of course, like I said, we're looking now at, um, at the BRICS, um, working more towards that, but also about getting a pan-African understanding across the continent in terms of how we leverage our oil and gas resources. Beyond, beyond just the African perspective, I mean, what about the, the impact it's having on OPEC and the sorts of discussions you have with fellow ministers uh, about, what this, <laughs> about a different future mm. for, for, for the energy outlook because of this extraordinary rapid change in the United States? Interestingly, I mean, we had our yearly OPEC uh, a conference yesterday. Um, I do apologize for coming in late. It's one of the reasons I'm just rushing in from Vienna, Austria. And we actually had to commission a study which was reported out to us in yesterday's meeting on the effects of um, the US shale oil and gas uh, on all our, our, our production and our volumes. And it is quite clear that it, the incidence is going to affect us quite greatly in the medium term. Um, over the next 10, 15 years. Now, there are uncertainties with shale oil and gas. The environmental uncertainties as, as it is. The actual production costs are quite steep. The US has handled it um, very, very uh, uh, well for a number of reasons. Not all other countries who have the resource will be able to do it in quite the same way. So right now, the concerns are really with the volumes that the U.S. is, is managing to generate but there could at be this point future in time. waves of development as, as other countries Yes, there could be. Excited. China, for instance, yeah. is looking at it. Argentina is looking at it. Even the, the, the British um, appear to have uh, reserves of, uh, of shale oil and gas and are looking at that as well. But we cannot put a number as of yet on exactly what uh, volumes uh, we will see after, say, 2030. But up till about that point, um, we think it will be rising fairly steadily. It will probably peak around that point and might even uh, begin to drop. But it will impact the entire global uh, scenario for oil and, and gas. And another crucial question that is sort of up, uh, in, in, in play at the moment is that whether the, the differential in pricing between uh, oil and gas will, mm. will start to move. Um, you know, particularly oil gas being much, much cheaper in uh, the United States and tends to be on long-term contracts. That presumably, as you rank, uh, uh, ramp up gas production, you're hoping that the price will be high, but um, what, what are your assumptions there? Well, this has been a major, major concern uh, for us. Um, our assumptions are that gas prices will drop um, no matter what uh, happens in the next will, will there uh, five be a global so. gas price in effect do you? i think so 
-hmm. We assume that you know, there will be. Um, it affects, and I, I want to make this point particularly, that it affects us, I think, um, particularly on the African continent because we depend so highly on natural resources at this time. Um, so it's an area that we're looking very, very closely at. Okay. Other questions? Yes, in the middle of the room, and then there's one at the back. So let's take this one first, and then, and then there's one at the back there. Yeah, the mic's got on its way. Thank you. Joshua Gubitz with Global Sphere, and Jim, this is a question for you. So on one hand, as was discussed earlier, we have a population that's set to increase by a couple billion people over the next several decades and a lot of additional mouths that need to be fed and a lot of additional food resources that are going to need to be required. On the other hand, um, certainly in Europe and in certain other markets around the world, we see a lot of resistance to GMOs and a lot of, let's say, um, aversion to GMOs and lack of acceptance of them. And I'm just wondering, on one hand, where do you see the GMO issue going in the year ahead or the couple years ahead? And also, how do we sort of reconcile these two conflicting desires or two conflicting demands? Yeah, it's really an important issue. Um, f first of all, there's a tremendous amount of science behind it, and the fact that we're involved in it you know, is, is a testimony to the fact that we're, we're confident and comfortable with the safety of the science. That doesn't mean that everybody's comfortable around the world, and we understand that. So we clearly, as an industry, uh, have a, a, a job to continue to do around communication, education, transparency, um, and uh, I regularly meet with, with folks that have a very different view than I do about the science, but you have to do that to understand where their concerns are coming from and, and how we might work together to find common ground. The, uh, there's no question that the, the tools around biotechnology are very powerful, and if we really are going to sustainably feed the population, we're going to need to use all the tools. It's not the only tool by any stretch, but it's, a, it's an important one. And so we think it's a, an important responsibility we have to continue to engage with the public. Um, obviously, also what's important from our point of view is making sure we have good product stewardship so that there aren't actually issues. And so far, that's, you know, we've had very good luck, uh, very good um, uh, track record in that regard. Um, but uh, if you, uh, we don't limit it to biotechnology in terms of traits. Um, the tools play a tremendous uh, uh, role already in just accelerating plant breeding. Uh, the fact that we can understand the genome of these plants now much, much better allows us to uh, identify the genes that are having an impact in the ultimate crop. And once we do that, we can, we can actually do plant breeding more quickly because we know what we're trying to get crossed. You don't have to cross it, plant it, grow it, wait for the season. So um, even that acceleration is going to help us try to keep pace with the increases in demand. So we think it's a really important tool. We acknowledge that not everybody uh, is comfortable yet, but most people are. It's being used by um, you know, over, uh, over 25 or 30 countries around the world and millions and millions of hectares uh, for over a decade. So uh, you know, we think it's, uh, it's a proven technology. But at the same time, we work with countries uh, and customers at the pace they're comfortable. And very, we have a, very quickly, do, yep. you, do you see labeling uh, as a big issue in 2014? Uh, uh, labeling is, in the US particularly, becoming an issue because people are trying to, yeah. to push for that. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some of the ballot initiatives have been really uh, s uh, not good legislation because they bring in a lot of other issues. Uh, but the idea of transparency, or maybe more importantly, the idea of customer choice, we uh, strongly support that. Uh, one of the important things is, as a technology provider, we don't own the food label. So we work closely with the food companies. They're, they're the ones who, uh, and the FDA uh, governing that, that has to be involved. But, um, but what we're trying to do is find ways to increase transparency, give consumers choice. Um, we don't think there's a reason you have to be concerned about the fact that there are GMOs. But if you are, we'd love to find a way for people to know that. OK. Uh, question at the back, I promise, uh, if you could keep it short and the answer short, because we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, Maurice Bloom, CWS. Uh, you mentioned, this is a question for Jim, uh, you mentioned about uh, more than 800 million undernourished uh, people in the world. We are also looking at a billion uh, obesity, uh, people touched by obesity. Uh, you know, and then you talk about double the production. I would like to hear something from you in terms of the food waste as well as quality of food. If you, if you could do that in 30 in seconds. seconds then, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, uh, excellent point. There's a tremendous amount of work going on, food waste. How do we extend shelf life? Uh, um, how do we detect foodborne pathogens more rapidly? Um, uh, I'll give you one example that we're excited about that is not the high, 
high-tech uh, developed country. We're working on an enzyme, a naturally occurring enzyme, that can fight off uh, bad bacteria in raw milk. Today, over half the milk in Kenya gets thrown away because it doesn't get to cold storage before it goes bad. Um, this enzyme, which is, as I said, naturally occurring, looks to be able to give it at least eight hours of additional shelf life. Before we launch it, we want to get it to 12 so the evening milk can go in with the morning milk. Um, if we can do that, that's a game changer for a lot of people's lives and nutrition and how do we get uh, you know, shelf lives extended and, and more nutritious uh, foods available to people. I want to just give one uh, last question to David because I think it's of interest to everyone. You have your finger on the pulse of the U.S. economy because you know who's, who's sending what to where. Uh, what, 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 do you, what do you take from this uh, past week, Thanksgiving, and, and the, the sort of general level of activity that you saw? Well, you know, one of the things that's unique about this year is there's many less ship, uh, sh shopping days, and for us, shipping days, between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we're seeing uh, an increase in volume per day. We expected somewhere around 8%. And part of that is because the economy is doing a little better, but part of it's just because there's less days. So, you know, many people think that Santa Claus delivers Christmas. Well, this year on our peak day, we're going to pick up 34 million packages, and on our peak delivery day, we're going to deliver 29 million. So we kind of think Santa really wears a brown uniform versus <laughs> a red. <laughs> okay, well, with that, uh, I'd like to thank all our panelists. Thank you very much for an excellent conversation. Thank you. Thanks,